Ladies and gentlemen, I plan to speak to you tonight to report on the State of the Union. But the events of earlier today have led me to change those plans. Today is a day for mourning and remembering. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the Shuttle Challenger. We know we share this pain with all of the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. Okay, welcome everyone to Maple Syrup number 254, Catholicism and Disasters, number 20, the Challenger Disaster, Space, Space Shuttle Challenger 1986. Anyone who is new joining us for the first time, obviously welcome. So glad to see you, although I'm not seeing you live if you're watching this on YouTube later on. I am now time traveling into the future when you're watching me on YouTube and you're watching me in the past. So the time space continuum has certainly been, been broken in some way. If you're new to our program, why is it called maple syrup history? I think I should, with a lot of new viewers coming on board and I'm really appreciative of that. And people watching this later online, I feel like I owe all those people an explanation. Um, Pope Francis has become a recent viewer. He's gonna be calling from the Vatican pretty soon. What is maple syrup history? What does that mean? Well, to all interested parties, maple syrup history just means heavy factual history. The way that maple syrup has ample viscosity, it's very, very thick. Maple syrup represents the facts of my history classes. This semester has been Catholicism and Disasters. Did a logic course in the past. That's also on our YouTube channel. Um, so anyways, this is episode number 254 of that overall kind of um, series, but number 20 of the specific Catholicism and disasters. Without further ado, Shara Krista Nee born Corrigan. Sharon Krista Corrigan, she went by Krista, and she's more famously known as Krista McAuliffe. And if you're familiar with the Challenger um, disaster at all, you know who Krista McAuliffe was. May God rest her soul and the other six astronauts of this fateful mission. Krista McAuliffe was the only Catholic on board the Challenger. Does that matter? Well, I mean, I don't, you tell me. For this class, it does. In Catholicism and Disasters, what we do is, once more, if you're new, previous episodes have been like the Hindenburg, the Titanic. I have 9-11 coming up soon, Chernobyl. We'll talk about the disaster first, the actual facts. We're certainly going to do that today, per usual. And then we talk about Catholic stuff related to it. So there you go. Of the seven astronauts on board, arguably the most famous one, because Krista McAuliffe, as you all might remember, was the winner of the Teacher in Space mm -hmm. contest. Yeah. She, um, she was the only Catholic on board. She was born September 2nd, 1948 in Boston, the oldest of five children. Uh, she gets married in 1970, age 22, has two kids, adding to the tragedy. And may we, I always say, you know, the, the point of all these classes, of the whole maple syrup history set, some previous things have not been tragedy-based at all. This semester, Catholicism and Disasters has been. One of the, the main points of this, besides the maple syrup itself, the facts, just learning stuff for its own sake, has been, if there are sad stories, unknown stories, to know about these people and pray for them. If like Kristen McAuliffe, there is a tragic note. Kristen McAuliffe had two children, age six and nine, when Challenger explodes. So very, very, very sad. Um, uh, Betsy Johnson wrote in the meeting chat, quote, before the Challenger disaster, I argued strongly that a civilian teacher with children should not be part of the crew. That's, that's very, very fair. Very, very fair. Um, good point, Betsy. Married in 1972, kids, 
McAuliffe was a social studies teacher, taught several courses, including American history, law, and economics, in addition to a self-designed course, quote, The American Woman. Very cool. Born in 1948, so Krista McAuliffe certainly comes of age in the 60s. Um, how liberal or conservative was she? I have no idea. I know that she was a Catholic from Boston. Very basic stuff. Um, that's, that's awesome, right? Designs this course called The American Woman. She was very much an active teacher. I'm going to talk about the selection process. Please note right away, 11,000 teachers apply to be selected for this teacher in space prize, the prize of which is being a member of this um, NASA crew. McAuliffe would take field trips, bring in speakers who were um, kind of elucidate some of her teaching techniques. And he's a very active teacher. Um, it's a terribly cheesy, corny, gross, cringe, like Disney teacher of the year. It's like punch me in the face. Fine. However, McAuliffe, being serious, giving her all the props she deserves, was this really above and beyond teacher, a go-getter teacher, right? Field trips, etc. And also, I can tell you this, my own personal history, a lot of you, I think, know this. If you do not, I have a PhD in history. Um why do I always say my name is Groshin Krzyzewski instead of my name is Dr. Groshin? Because my name isn't doctor. I hate that. Hi, my name is Dr. Steve. Your parents named you doctor? I hate that, that kind of pretentious nonsense. Please just call me Groshin if you ever stop by our, our um, environs here on the Palouse. But I have a PhD in history, and I can tell you as a historian that this next thing McCullough did as a teacher is very much cutting edge, right? Quote, she emphasized the impact of ordinary people on history, saying they were just as important as kings, politicians, generals, whatever. That's that's spot on for where the historical profession has been for a long time. Professional historians for a long time, for time immemorial, emphasized great man history. I don't, you don't need to know anything about the 1770s in Russia except Catherine the Great. That's great man history. And McAuliffe is like, no quote unquote, bottom up stuff, the ordinary man and woman's important. Okay. Now, why do they do this? Uh, do you think, does NASA do anything that doesn't benefit them? Of course not. Have you ever heard of an organization that does something seemingly altruistic that doesn't have a kickback effect? No. Sorry for sounding cynical. Why is NASA agreeing along with President Ronald Reagan who opened our um, maple syrup proceedings today. People alive and classic, what are you talking about? I'm recording this on the Zoom later. When I put it into a file, I'm going to have Reagan's, I have already, again, the future time, space, past, depending upon if you're listening later on YouTube or, or with us now live in the classroom, I'm going to have Reagan, 27 seconds of Ron Reagan's um, address, the American people. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I plan on offering the State of the Union tonight etc. Circumstances have changed. If you're watching later on the recording or listening in your car, whatever, you've already heard Reagan, you know, open our class. Why did Reagan and NASA do this teacher in space program? Why? Why is the American government, our leaders, interested in putting a teacher in space? Kristen McCullough is a boss. Kristen McCullough is a great teacher, beloved by her students, etc. She's not an astronaut. She, 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 forever, she forever is now. Krista McCullough forever, it, she, when she wins this program, I'll get to that in a second, takes a year off from teaching, gets trained, has to pass all the medical um, examinations. Betsy Johnson correctly says, to get money. Exactly. The NASA program, this is no longer the time of the Apollo missions. People are kind of like, that's old news. You know, the moon landing, 69. I don't even remember the moon landing, man. I was still recovering from Woodstock. That's kind of the attitude. And especially now, 1980s, the space stuff is old news. Well, NASA says, hey, you know what Americans love? Americans are kind of cheesy too. Americans love teachers because non-cheesy Americans, of course, are like education are, is this the backbone of our country. Of course, teachers are important. And super cheesy Disney teacher of the year, Americans love teachers. So everyone likes teachers. NASA and Reagan say, hey, guess what? And Betsy is correct. If we put a teacher in space, guess who's going to care about that? Everyone in America. I bet they'll care about the space program again and donate money and stuff. Exactly. 
So, with Reagan's Star Wars program or the movie Star Wars? No, Reagan's program. Got it. Excellent question. So remember, yeah, Reagan, 1983, Star Wars, this kind of muscular foreign diplomacy. Um, not to get too far off on a, on a tangent, but John Lewis Gaddis, the famous American historian, talks about strategies of containment and says he compares and contrasts asymmetrical to symmetrical approaches to foreign policy. You know, what is symmetrical approach? It's boots on the ground. Meet every communist threat head on. Symmetrical approaches are Vietnam, Korea. Asymmetrical, which begins with John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State during the Eisenhower years, comes back with Reagan's Star Wars program. Everyone in Moscow thinks Moscow, not Idaho, obviously Russia, but maybe Moscow, Idaho too, thinks Ron Reagan is crazy. He's this crazy cowboy actor guy who has a button on his desk and he's going to press that button and blow a bunch of stuff up. I don't know what, but everything's going to be mad blown up. So the Star Wars program is this kind of muscular, you know, we uh, don't have to put boots on the ground to win the Cold War. I, Reagan, with my allies, like Margaret Thatcher, Pope John Paul II, and kind of the inspiration for Lech Wałęsa and the Solidarity Movement uh, in Poland, my personal relationship with Gorbachev, that kind of thing, right? Who, who's trying to just glass nose and perestroika. Star Wars is part and parcel of this of like, we don't have to put boots on the ground. We just have to threaten them with the bomb. Okay. How much does this factor in? I don't think a lot. I don't think it has anything to do with Cold War machismo. In fact, you know, I was being kind of sarcastic. The George Lucas Star Wars franchise comes out, I think, in the mid-70s. I would say it would have more to do with that even. It's very possible. Krista McCullough talks about, I never gave up in my dream of becoming an astronaut. And by the way, to her credit, Krista McCullough is a legit astronaut. She started off as just this teacher applying for thing. By the time she was done, they had transformed her into her astronaut. Mm -hmm. but we're going to talk about what she was going to be doing on the flight as a payload specialist. She's legit. She's as much as those other people, 100%. In fact, when I read you the crew, it was going to be Krista McCullough's first time in space, first time in space for other NASA people, real NASA people too. She's 100% she's a real astronaut. She starts off as part of this public relations campaign to get money for NASA and all but um, ends up becoming as legit as anyone. But to answer your question, a very good question, I would say that actually no joke would have more to do with Star Wars interest in space, like Luke Skywalker and stuff like that, than actual Cold War diplomacy. And what does it have to do with, above all, one of the great American values, money, cash, Benjamins, thick wads of greenbacks, snapping, rubber bands breaking in half, money, 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 cash, money, Gordon Gecko, greed is good, Michael Douglas, 1987, Wall Street movie, things like that. It's about increasing visibility of NASA getting funding. Betsy writes, um, and Betsy, I cannot thank you enough. You know, we have like, I don't know how many people we have in this class. Too much to count. There's thousands watching online. And Betsy Johnson keeps that chat just churning, like as if, as if all of us were Amish Mennonites churning butter in 17th century Pennsylvania. This is legit. Betsy writes, wasn't Star Wars supposed to be, wasn't Star Wars supposed to be defensive, freeing us from the fear of attack? Um, yeah, I mean, technically, it's supposed to be defensive, like Grace Martin can attest to, who ran the, the nuclear ballistics program for America in the late 80s. We're just ready if you guys do anything that you're not supposed to do. Grace, hello, welcome. All right, so, Grace, what have you missed so far? Um, we just talked about one of the seven astronauts on this fateful Challenger mission. Her name is Krista McAuliffe. That's what we're talking about today, Challenger. Yeah, we came for a really good episode. She is a teacher. Uh, the only Catholic on board. All right. So McAuliffe, yeah, Reagan starts his program, right? And he says, he seconds what NASA says, that we hoped sending a teacher into space would increase public interest in the space shuttle program and also demonstrate the reliability of space flight at a time when the agency was under continuous pressure to find financial support. And Reagan said it would also remind Americans of the important role that teachers and education serve in the country. Reagan's the man. Um, I am not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm none of your business. I've said that a million times. I'm not going to influence your. I like Reagan's like swagger so much. Reagan could like show up in like a Maserati and Nancy Reagan is wearing like diamonds that are worth $6 trillion. And he's like, I'm straight Hollywood, right? And just be like absolute alpha level Clint Eastwood actor guy. And then also be like, teachers are the 
backbone of our country, like the sweetest, nicest, like, and the grandmas, I love him. I love Reagan. So Reagan could appeal to all, all kind of people. Yeah, he's good at acting. Spoiler alert, Reagan, who is an actor, just wait for this. You won't believe this, was good at acting. Um, <laughs> so Krista, Krista McAuliffe says in 1985, quote, I cannot join the space program and restart my life as an astronaut. But this opportunity to connect my abilities as an educator with my interest in history and space is a unique opportunity to fulfill my early fantasies. I will never give up. God bless her. That's awesome. Never give up on your dreams. Kristen McAuliffe is already doing a great job at life. She's married, two kids, successful teacher. She's like, that's not good enough in a good way. I always wanted to go to space and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply. So in the initial applicant pool, there's 11,000 people. Yeah, wow indeed. 114 semifinalists were nominated by state, territorial, and agency review panels. All right. So out of, I don't know what the percentage is immediately, it's close to 1%. Out of 11,000 people who apply, everyone goes into the slush pile except for 114. McCullough is one of two teachers nominated by the state of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. The semifinalists gathered in DC, June 22nd, 27, 1985 for a conference on space. And on July 1st, 1985, McCulloch was announced as one of the 10 finalists. So McCulloch, our hero, our heroine of the story, tragic heroine, Krista McCulloch is now one of 10 of an initial 11,000 person pool. On July 7th, she travels to Johnson Space Center for a week of thorough medical examinations and briefings. And these people are interviewed out the wazoo. They're just absolutely interviewed out the kind of like, just fill in your favorite, whatever. An evaluation committee composed of senior NASA officials. Um, and the committee makes recommendations to the NASA administrator, administrator himself, James M. Beggs, to nominate primary and backup candidates for Challenger mission. On July 19th, 1985, George H.W. Bush, who of course, he's a future president, he's Reagan's vice president this time, announces McCulloch had been selected for the position. Another teacher, Barbara Morgan, serves will serve as the backup. Please note, Barbara Morgan is the first teacher in space, tragically, right? I'm going to read you second by second what happens here. Imagine you're Kristen McCulloch and Barbara Morgan at this point, both legends. You're, you're, you're two people out of 11,000. Wow. You, you're probably at that time, like, you got to keep your ego in check. I must be legit, right? Yeah. Was there any um, preference for women on this? Or did it just happen to be those? I would say probably yes. I haven't come across that like men men need not apply, but I would guess like McAuliffe in the logo, I'll show you the logo of the mission. Anyone know what her logo is after her name? They have almost like a patch. I guess you could like apply and they have all the astronaut names in Apple, right? An apple, the teacher is shining the apple, the kind of schoolyard, the, the 40 year old sweet, a driven woman fits that role perfectly. I, I imagine. I imagine if it wasn't open, like no, no dudes, they're probably like, look, we got to have a woman. Of the seven people on the on the flight, if I'm not mistaken, let me just check 100 percent I believe uh yeah, there's only one other woman. I'll read you the whole crew in a second. Judith Resnick, um, mission specialist number two. So there's Judith Judith Resnick, one female astronaut and five dudes. The teacher, let's make her a woman. They're probably, they're probably like, yeah. I don't know if that, that was official, um, but anyways, before I continue back, Betsy writes, I went to college with a girl who was called by her middle name, Reagan, because her parents loved bedtime for Bonzo. They seem like good parents. That sounds awesome. You know what, guys? Bedtime stories, they're not, they're becoming like a lost relic of old Americana. You pull out Hans Christian Andersen, original Little Mermaid, circa 1837 at bedtime, that's parenting at the absolute high level. That's A level marks. Yes, Brad. Aren't most teachers, you know, in high school as well as women anyway? I know how sexist is that. Right. That's so sexist. Yeah, I feel right. I feel like no, of course, yeah. <laughs> how dare you, Grace? <laughs> no. I don't feel comfortable with male piano teachers. Men can't play piano. See, this is what I'm talking about. They play, they can't. Men are always being men are always being told what they can't do. I'm sick of this. I'm with Ryan, I'm with Ryan Gosling's Ken character. I want to like learn about and let's do patriarchy. Like I just yeah. I'm, I'm, 
I am exactly get the horses out. I'm done with this. Like men can't do this. I don't trust men. All this kind of nonsense. All right. So Bush, July 19th, 1985, announces that McAuliffe has won. Barbara Morgan is her backup. According to Mark Travis of the Concord Monitor, it was McAuliffe's mannerism that set her apart from other candidates. NASA official Alan Ladwig said, quote, she had an infectious enthusiasm. NASA psychiatrist Terrence McGuire told New Woman Magazine, quote, she was the most broad-based, best balanced person of the 10. So McAuliffe and Morgan, remember, Barbara Morgan, her backup, who will wait, the teacher program is discontinued, teacher in space after this tragedy. And yet Barbara Morgan, they're like, you're a legend too, you're the backup. They keep her on. She actually goes into space successfully. Mm -hmm. And Barbara Morgan, I believe, is still alive today. So um, McCullough and Morgan each take a year-long leave of absence in order to train for the space shuttle mission. This is cool. This is what I'm talking about. It's like, if anyone's seen the movie Invincible, about the guy who's a bartender, becomes an NFL player, that's not the normal way to become an NFL player. You know, how, how are you going to become an NFL player? Well, I'm going to try to be good in college and play for the Vandals. That's a good path. I'm trying to be good in high school and, uh, you know, I'm going to go play in the SEC, play for Nick Saban and the Alabama Crimson Side. It's a good path. I'm probably just going to be a bartender and then show up to an open tryout and then I'll make it. That's not a normal path. But in this story, it's a true story. This guy just like runs a very fast, let's say 40 yard dash, a tryout, gets signed. Does anyone care when during the game he returns a punt for a touchdown? Does the ref say, well, that was a touchdown, but you're a bartender, so it doesn't count? No. So, so same thing here, like being a teacher, not an astronaut at first is not the normal way to go to space. But after this year of training, after this year of training where Kristen McCullough started off as quote unquote, just a teacher, as some people might deride her in the space community. Oh, she's not, you know, she didn't do all this flight time and F-16s and Air Force. Like she starts off at just a teacher. After all this training, she is a legit member of this crew. I want to specify that. There are seven astronauts on this mission. It's not six plus teacher. By the time they're ready to take off, she is legit. And her duties, uh, her duties would be to include science experiments in the fields of chromatography, hydroponics, magnetism, and Newton's laws. And this is where the polishing the apple thing comes in. Uh, McCullough was going to do two closed circuit, like zoom streams, would be the analogy today from space, two lessons. She was planning on conducting two 15-minute classes from space after a brief tour of the spacecraft. Hey, everyone, this is uh, Miss McCullough or Mrs. McCullough or whatever her students called her in New Hampshire. They, they, she probably was like, hey, this is your girl C. You know, it's probably, probably formal, probably, probably, you know, Miss McCullough. After showing the tour of the spacecraft, Kristen McCullough was going to do a, a lesson on, quote, the ultimate field trip and another one called Where We've Been, Where We're Going, why? The lessons were set to be broadcast to millions of school children via closed circuit TV. So cool. I mean, she was going to become a movie star. Krista McAuliffe, once more, her and the other six, may God rest their souls. All condolences and love to those families for whom the mention of this disaster might feel like it was yesterday. They, you know, you never get over something like that. It's a terrible tragedy. Krista McAuliffe already is a legend. And forever a legend because of this kind of Pompeii-like tragedy around something that, that increases the legendary status. She was going to become, like she already was, the most famous teacher in America, a true celebrity. Probably comes back, cover of Time magazine, all, all the whole treatment. She won the lottery. You know, one out of 11,000 to become a famous, famous former civilian, uh, soon to be star. So she's going to do these two lessons broadcast to millions of school children. It's going to serve the purpose we talked about before. Uh, increasing funding for NASA and just all good stuff. She also intended to keep a personal journal. And I love this quote, quote, like a woman on the Conestoga wagons pioneering the West. So yeah, I mean, she's going to this final frontier, right? Is McAuliffe famous before she ever sits in that shuttle? Yes. After being chosen to be the first teacher in space, McAuliffe was a guest on Good Morning America. CBS World News, the Today, Today Show, and the Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. She's she makes the rounds. Guess what? How many people to now watch Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel? A lot less. We have YouTube channels. Uh, you know, our interest level is very divided. 
bifurcated, fractured. Everybody watched Johnny Carson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like whatever, like Leno, who's not even on anymore, Letterman, whatever those guys got, plus Jimmy Fallon, that's like that Johnny Carson got that entire audience. Everybody in America is watching. So, so she is super, super famous. Uh, when asked about the mission, she stated, so boss, ready? When asked about the mission, she stated, quote, if you're offered a seat on a rocket ship, don't ask what seat, just get on. Legend. That's great. It's a great quote. You know, she had an immediate rapport, uh, rapport with the media, like was seen as very kind of media savvy. You know, awesome. Which I, I can imagine teachers probably have that skill. They're used to like, how do I get these freaking third graders to pay attention? Oh, I'll do a song and dance. Like she, yeah, she probably like was comfortable with like performing in a sense. So the connective thread maybe here is like this is the lecture unintentionally of actors. You know, Reagan is president. McAuliffe like doing a great job being herself, promoting teachers, all this kind of thing. All right, guys, about to transition to talking about the actual day itself. Just a quick note on Barbara Morgan, born November 28th, 1951. So she is uh, three years younger than Kristen McCullough. Um, she was a backup, but they kept her on. It's very cool. She trained as a mission specialist and flew on STS-118 in August 2007. So she had to wait you know, 21 years. But yes, but Barbara Morgan, the backup on the original Challenger mission is the first teacher officially in space. Because tragically, the Challenger explodes 72 seconds into flight. It is only, it is only traversed 18 miles. It never leaves Earth in a certain sense. Okay. January 28th, 1986, 11.38 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. From launching uh, area LC 39B at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Space Shuttle Challenger. Um, everybody is watching this on TV. I think I remember someone saying, just so tragic. If anyone saw the promo video I put on Flocknote in our YouTube channel, uh, you, you know, the footage is there of, of, this, of the space sh uh, ship going into the plume of fire and exploding. It was broadcast live on CNN. People saw this happen live on CNN. Of course they did, because this was so famous. People were ready to see not that happen. They were ready to see a successful launch. Everyone's watching. I think 17% of the country watched it live. That is insane. So let's just do quick math. Let's just call it 20%, say one-fifth. I think in America today, there's what, 300 some? It's, 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 since we're bumping 17 up to, up to 20, I think it's like 330. So let's drop it to 300. To even it out. So 300 million Americans, 20% of that is 60 million Americans. Imagine if today 60 million Americans watch something happen. I think the Super Bowl has some kind of number like that. Was close to that. Okay. It's it's still a massive number. 60 million people watching something um happen in real time. My mom saw it. Your mom saw it. How old is your mom when this happened? 1986, January 86, 16. Okay. Where? Yeah, my parents were my parents were um, in their twenties when this happened. My aunt in her early thirties. I mean, this is a very recent, you know, event. This is one year before I was born. I was born in eighty seven. Um, so it's all kind of our lifetime, in some ways. Uh, Betsy Johnson writes correctly. Live in grade school classrooms throughout the country. I mean, that's brutal. That's awful. May God have mercy. That is terrible. Yeah, you know. And what do you say? Your reaction is exactly. Just yeah, that's it. I mean, just like, I don't know, there's nothing to say. There's nothing to say but pray. And just that, that really is awful. Expecting to see the familiar glow of rockets and plumes of smoke from a successful launch, Americans watched as 73 seconds after takeoff, the shuttle exploded. The shuttle does not even make it a minute and a half before bursting into not just flames, starts burning first, but just explodes into, it looks like nothing it's almost. It's like a powder keg of explo explosive material after have, having traveled 18 miles. Challenger broke apart 73 seconds into its flight, disintegrated 46,000 feet above the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Cape Canaveral, Florida at 11.39 a.m. It was the first fatal accident involving an American spacecraft while in flight. Does anyone know what the cause was? They did a whole study. I'm going to go through the whole thing. If you don't know the answer, I'll tell you. But yeah, what was it? It was that something. Yeah. Oh, 
No, go for it though, yeah. Um, I think it was there was a leak caused by the vibration of the shuttle. So the, the O-rings is the more technical term. Let me actually just read it from, from the notes. The cause of disaster was the failure of the primary and secondary redundant O-ring seals in a joint in the shuttle's right, so, right solid rocket booster. The O-rings, because of something, I'm going to ask you a second question, and I'll tell you. Uh, the O-rings, uh, they, they don't properly seal. Because of what? What was the huge problem? Betsy Johnson has the right answer. I'll read her answer in a second. Um, Betsy just absolutely just dominates the chat. Um, it's pure domination. Um, anyone know what the cause was? The O-rings not sealing. It's one cause, period. Betsy's exactly right. Exactly. Launching in cold weather. I'll read in a second, but the, the engineers tell people, look, for these O-rings and everything to work good, just from engineering, I'm a super math nerd kind of guy. Like, here's the calculations, dude. You cannot launch in these temperatures. It must be at least 52 degrees Fahrenheit. That morning, I think it was at 1.18 degrees, like 34 degrees colder, and warms up just a little bit above freezing, 34, 35. Remember, the launch is January 28th, 1986. The record low temperatures... 18 degrees. Isn't that crazy? The record low temperatures, as Betsy correctly identified, thank you, Betsy, on the morning of the launch had stiffened the rubber O-rings, reducing their ability to seal the joints. Shortly after liftoff, the seals were breached and hot pressurized gas leaked through the joint and burned the aft attachment strut, connecting it to the external propellant tank, then into the tank itself. The collapse of the external propellant tank's internal structures and rotation of the SRB, SRB once more stands for solid rocket booster, that followed through the shuttle stack, traveling at a speed of Mach 1.92 into a direction which allowed aerodynamic forces to tear it apart. Uh, quick, we're gonna, I'm gonna read you the, the, the play by play, but as always, anyone new to Catholicism and disasters, we talk about Catholic stuff. Today we started with Kristen McCullough. We're gonna finish with Catholic reactions. We often finish the class with Catholic reactions, but we always begin with play by play. I will give you that. We always talk about disaster first, but just jumping ahead, what is the kind of after effect? The disaster resulted in a 32 month hiatus in the space shuttle program. Reagan creates the Rogers Commission to investigate the accident. And these people, uh, you know, they say it was in fact this, this flaw in the O rings and the decision to go ahead with launch when temperatures were not conducive to do so. Really quickly, what do we have coming up next week, next Monday already, Chernobyl. Why does Chernobyl explode? Very O-ring style, a design flaw in the RBMK reactors, the Chernobyl um, a power plant. When you press the AZ-5 button to shut everything down, the control rods were supposed to shoot into the reactor core and, and shut everything down. Unfortunately, they were graphite tip, which accelerates radioactivity. So this design flaw in the RBMK reactor that leads to our next disaster, we'll talk about Chernobyl, um, very much here too. This kind of thing where it's like details, 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 right? Okay, let's talk about who is on this mission. Let me just quickly, uh, let me quickly um, show you the, the logo. I'm gonna show up with the people online first. And I'm gonna move my face out of the way. If anyone wants to watch this on YouTube later, I think I got the whole screen. What's so cool about having it recorded on YouTube is you can pause the video, duh. I'm not even trying to be sarcastic or funny, I'm serious. So you can look at this logo as long as you want. Um, but you see here, all you guys, they have everyone's name on it. And please notice McAuliffe at the bottom has an apple by her name to signify teacher in space. All right, who is on this uh, fateful mission? Commander, Francis R. Dick Scobie would have been his second space flight. Pilot is Michael J. Smith. Would have been his first. Remember, it's not just McCall, the teacher. All these guys have been in space 30,000 times. No. The commander, Francis R. Dick Scobie, it would have been his second, but pilot Michael J. Smith, his first space flight. Um, Gregory B. Jarvis, payload specialist one, first space flight. Uh, the three mission specialists, mission specialists one, two, and three in order, would have been second for all of them. Elson, Onizuka, Judith Resnick, and Ronald McNair, and then McAuliffe is at the end. So once more, without you just, just reading these names once more, without any kind of distraction or rabbit holes. Commander Francis Dick Scobie, pilot Michael Smith, 
Mission Specialist 1, Elson Onizuka. Mission Specialist 2, Judith Resnick. Mission Specialist 3, Ronald E. McNair. Payload Specialist 1, Gregory B. Jarvis. Payload Specialist 2, Krista McCall. Okay. What are the objectives of the Challenger mission? Well, I'll read them to you. Deployment of tracking data relay satellite B with an inertial upper stage booster. Number two, flight of shuttle pointed autonomous research tool for astronomy. Three, fluid dynamics experiment. Four, Comet Halley active or Comet Haley active monitoring program, which was a uh, made into the acronym CHAMP, the Comet Halley, Comet Haley active monitoring program. Phase partitioning experiment is objective number five. Number six is three shuttle student involvement program experiments. Uh, number seven, two lessons for the teacher in space project. And now here's where we're going to appeal to like cheesy Americans, right? Like where it's like, this is so not cheesy. This is so boss. So amazing. These experiments, so high level science. But then Ron McNair is going to play the saxophone <laughs> in space because some people like that, you know? <laughs> some people are like, oh, cool. Kenny G plays saxophone, right? So Ron McNair is going to go full Kenny G. Is there any scientific point to this? Actually, yeah. No, there's not. For what? It worked for Clinton. It worked for Clinton? So how did it work? Okay, so Bill Clinton, I need to know this. I'm obsessed with the 1990s. Bill Clinton playing the sax like added to his swagger or did it, someone say like, hey, Lewinsky thing and he started playing the sax. Oh, never mind. What What do you mean? Like he went on, he went on. Uh, oh, got it. So as a campaign tool, Yeah. I wasn't going to vote for Clinton. Oh, wait, did you see him on Carson playing the sax? He's got my vote. Okay. The sax is subliminal? Yeah. Okay. No, like the messaging of it was really the sax. Can yeah. you guys tell how much I hate the saxophone? Is that evident? Good. They sound cool, but I hate when they're playing next to me. Good. Yeah. I'm glad I'm glad you hate it because I was if you liked it, I was gonna have to not respect you anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> Chuck it, you can, because it's kind of a, a query that's not- Go for it, related. 100%. Okay, so if we had something like a space race in America today, like, like let's say um, there's like a Mars race going on with Russia or something like that, do you think that could have like, do you think America was in a better position to be unified on an exciting like group project like that? Back then? Back then? Yes. In a new group project. No, yes. Yeah. Definitely way more unified. Again, like uh, people that I know that are like my liberal friends, you know, hate Reagan. Oh, he was so bad on domestic issues, blah, 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 trickle down economics. Conservatives and most people, Reagan has a favorable opinion, I'd say, for most people, you know, love him. He's the greatest president ever. Republican candidates will talk about the party of Lincoln and Reagan. It's like every time they say that, they should be like buzzed with something like Cal Fence. <laughs> when I become president in the party of Lincoln and oh oh sorry I, I mean wait what was I saying sorry back to my point I hate I hate I hate cliches but it's yeah yeah Reagan is so famous right like he's like the, he's held up next to Abraham Lincoln um wh why am I saying this what was the point of making that point he was really good at, at unifying the country getting everyone involved get behind America we're fighting the Soviets we're also trying to get America back on our feet after the stagflation Carter years which of course becomes very political. I'm, I'm blaming Jimmy Carter for, but it's still, you know, all the kind of 70s malaise. Uh, Reagan was a great unifier. Reagan, Reagan, again, surprise, surprise, great actor, could like whip you up with a, his, his first inaugural address is freaking so alpha. <laughs> it's so awesome. Like, even if you hate the guy, you're like, that was an amazing speech. He's just a great orator. And Reagan uh, could get people behind stuff. There's no way Biden or Trump or anyone today can get people excited about anything. It's just like, I hate Trump so much. I hate Biden so much. except those camps that it's like, no matter what they say, it's bad. I mean, it'd be so funny to be like, do you support these things? Go on the street and show people five things. Like, oh yeah, I do support that. And then you'd be like, oh yeah, but this is, these are quotes from Trump or Biden. And, oh no, no, never mind. I don't support Like, the, It's like the, the, the personal uh, animus, animosity is so strong. And there's such political division our country no your question is first of all very on point i don't think there's any unity in america today to get behind anything back in the 80s liberals conservatives both sides would even say about reagan even if they hated reagan that's my president like he's noble he's does a good job and i respect the office and like so there's way more unity back then i think
Yeah. And you're, and you're pretty sure it's not just like, oh, like a, a good old days. No, no. Because you're right. The, the, that can happen sometimes. A hundred percent. No, that that's so brilliant on your part. I'm not trying to like over compliment you. That's such a brilliant analysis. There, there are no good old days because every day should be the good day. I mean, every day it's like, we're in this Valley of tears. Christ died for our sins and we got to get on with life and do our best. So, so now should be the best day. Cause I got to do all I have is now the past is gone. There is no future. I got to work now. So that's the positive. The negative side is there were never good days. People always sucked. People always were clowns and like fighting and doing bad stuff. There was never, oh, back when morality was serious. Really, dude? Like, stop, you know? <laughs> so like, no, it's like, you know, oh, the 80s, the good old days. When you, when you couldn't go into a city, you know, and like, the, 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 look at those, the AIDS epidemic and the war on drugs. Even if you're more and more liberal and you're like, you know, the war on drugs is an overreach. And I'm not going to get political. I am not left or right or anything. I'm just based. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that term. I love that term. I know. I love that term so much. I can't say that laughing. Um, no, being serious though. Like, I don't want to get political on like the war on drugs. That wasn't good. There was like crack cocaine in everywhere in America and stuff. So they, I'm not trying to say the 80s were this miraculous golden age, although people really love the 80s a lot. If you don't believe me, go and look at like 80s music and look at the comments. Like, I I was born in 2001. I feel cheated by life. You know, like people love the 80s. And now I'm just as guilty. Why do you think we're doing, you know, Challenger and Chernobyl and all this 80s stuff? I love the 80s too. But it's like, it's not looking back with rose-colored glasses. Those times don't exist. It's a fact. People were more unified then. We had this overt common enemy, the Soviet Union, the evil empire, as Reagan said, and people were way more, you know, willing to get behind stuff. Now, guys, yes, Brad? Kind of jumped out at me. It was a big project like this. It's a lot of job. We want to keep things on schedule and all this kind of stuff. And we some little character out in the background going, hey, cool. <laughs> and that information, I wonder if afterwards they came up with a better way of keeping track of all those little details for the, that little guy out in the wilderness. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, well, that's that's actually one of the that's one of the article reaction points I have at the end about not ignoring warnings. And so, to your point, we talked about the mission objectives. Do you guys know when the launch find takes off? What number it is of them trying to launch? It's number seven. They had canceled six previous launch attempts. Let me read them to you. Remember, they launch on January twenty eighth. The first planned attempt, January twenty second rescheduled reason just delays second attempt january 23rd rescheduled same thing delays number three january 24th scrub weather at transatlantic uh site was not was not good mm -hmm. number four january 25th scrub because of launch preparation delays number five january 27th scrub equipment failures and orbiter closeout crosswinds at shuttle landing site number six january 28th delayed technical issues with wind fire detection system. There are six non-starts, false starts. Imagine a football analogy. That's 30, 30 yards of penalty, five yards every false start. That's brutal. Remember the Vandals have six false starts in a row. Wow, guys, get it together. When they finally launch, the, the, the fateful launch is number seven, January 28th, 1986 at 1138 in the morning. The air temperature on January 28th was predicted to be a record low for a space, space shuttle launch. It was forecast to drop to 18 degrees Fahrenheit overnight before rising to 22 and 26 at the scheduled launch time of 9.38 in the morning. Based upon O-ring erosion that had occurred in warmer launches, Morton vehicle engineers were concerned over the effect the record cold temperatures would have on the seal provided by the SRB O-rings for the launch. Cecil Houston, the manager of the KS KSC office of the Marshall Space Flight Center, set up a conference call on the evening of January 27th to discuss the safety of the launch. Engineers expressed their concerns, once more, about the effect of low temperatures on the resilience of the rubber O-rings. As the colder temperatures lowered the elasticity of the rubber O-rings, engineers feared they would not be the O-rings would not be extruded to form a seal at the time of the launch. They must seal or what happened, happens. The, the engineers argued they did not have enough data to determine whether the O-rings would seal at temperatures colder than 53 degrees Fahrenheit, which was the coldest launch of the space shuttle to date. Okay. So um, I'll get I'll get to that in a second. I don't think it gets higher than like mid 30s. So 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 the morning is 18. 
Yeah, the, 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 the coldest, the night before, it's 18 degrees, which is my, it's just 35 degrees colder than it has to be. The, 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 the one where the engineers say we've launched successfully and the O-ring sealed, the coldest launch was 53 degrees Fahrenheit. We don't know below that. Maybe they'll seal, maybe there's no problem, but we don't know. Um, so remember, guys, it was supposed to drop to 18 degrees Fahrenheit. An overnight measurement taken by the KSC ICE team recorded the left SRB was 25 degrees Fahrenheit and the right was only eight degrees Fahrenheit. Eight degrees Fahrenheit. Um, in addition to its effect on the O-rings, the cold temperatures caused ice to form on the fixed service structure. To keep pipes from freezing, water was slowly run from the system. As a result, ice formed from 240 feet down in the freezing temperatures. Engineers at Rockwell International were concerned that ice would be violently thrown during launch and could potentially damage, damage the orbiter's thermal protection system or be aspirated into one of the engines. The launch was delayed for an additional hour to allow more ice to melt. The ice team performed an inspection at T minus 20 minutes, which indicated the ice was clearing. Okay, it seems like it's going to be fine. They give the all go to launch at 11.38 a.m. With the air temperature now at 36 degrees. So minus 16 of what we know the O-rings seal at. At T plus zero, minus 16, the temperature is 36. That's minus 16 of 52, which we know is the coldest temperature where a successful launch took place. So they're minus 16 degrees Fahrenheit where they want to be. The, the engineers are saying the lowest recorded temperature that was a successful launch was 52 degrees. And we're minus 16. We're at 36. We're, so we're in uncharted territory when the launch takes off. At T plus zero, what does T plus zero mean? It means zero hours, zero seconds the, when it happens. When I read you this stuff, by the way, T plus 58, that's 58 seconds in. T plus 68, 68 seconds after launch, just so you know, like FYI. At T plus zero, Challenger launched from the Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39B, beginning at T plus 0 0.678 until T plus 3.3 seconds, nine puffs of dark gray smoke were recorded escaping from the right-hand SRB near the aft strut that attached the booster to the ET. It was later determined these smoke puffs were caused by joint rotation in the aft field joint of the right hand SRB at ignition. The cold temperature had prevented the O rings from creating the seal. Rainfall from the preceding time the launch pad had likely accumulated in the field joint, further compromising the sealing capability of the O rings. As a result, hot gas was able to travel past the O rings and erode them. Molten aluminum oxides from the burn propellant resealed the joint and created a temporary barrier against further hot gas and flame escaping through the field joint. At T plus 58.788, very precise on time, 58.788 seconds, almost a minute after launch, a tracking film camera captured the beginnings of a plume near the aft attached strut on the right SRB right before the vehicle passed through uh, the, the almost the, the minute mark, 59 seconds. The high aerodynamic forces and wind shear likely broke the aluminum oxide seal that had replaced the road O-rings, allowing the flame to burn through the joint. Within one second from when it was first recorded, the plume became well-defined, and the enlarging hole caused a drop in internal pressure in the right SRB. A leak had begun in the liquid hydrogen tank of the ET, as indicated by the changing shape of the plume. This now at 64 seconds. At 68 seconds, Capcom Richard O. Covey told the crew that the SSMEs had throttled up to 104% thrust. In response to Covey, Scobie said, remember, Nick Scobie, he's the main captain of the ship, so to speak. He used the Titanic analogy. He's Captain Smith. Scobie said, quote, Roger, go at throttle up. This was the last communication from Challenger on the air-to-ground loop. At T72.284 seconds, the right SRB pulled away from the aft strut, causing lateral acceleration that was felt by the crew. At the same time, pressure in the LH2 tank began dropping. Pilot Mike Smith said, uh-oh, which was the last speech recorded of the crew. At T plus 73.124, white vapor was seen flowing away from the ET, after which the aft dome of the LH2 tank fell off. 
The resulting release of all liquid hydrogen in the tank pushed the LH2 tank forward into a liquid oxygen tank with a force equating to roughly 3 million pounds, while the right SRB collided with the intertank structure. These events resulted in an abrupt change to the shuttle stacks at all, um, all altitude and direction, which was shrouded from view by the vaporized contents of the now destroyed ET. As it traveled, as we said before, it almost Mach 2, Mach 1.92. Challenger took aerodynamic forces it was not designed to withstand and broke into several large pieces. A wing, the still firing main engines, the crew cabin and hypergolic fuel leaking from the ruptured reaction control system were among the parts identified exiting the vapor cloud. The disaster unfolded at an altitude of 46,000 feet. Both SRBs survived the breakup of the shuttle stack and continued flying now unguided by the trajectory control of the mothership until their flight termination systems were activated at T plus 110 seconds. The crew cabin, which was made of reinforced aluminum separating the one piece from the rest of the orbiter, it then traveled in a ballistic arc, reaching the apogee of 65,000 feet, approximately 25 seconds after the explosion. At the time of separation, the maximum acceleration is estimated to have been between 12 and 20 times that of gravity is unbelievable, unbelievable. Within two seconds, it dropped below 4G, and within 10 seconds, the cabin was in free fall. But this is very scary, and just, again, God rest their souls. Despite all this, the forces involved at this stage were probably insufficient to cause major injury to the crew. Really? So there's wow. speculation that perhaps these guys do not die until their shuttle hits the ocean. Like, they're aware of, like, it's exploded, we are going to die which could be an enormous grace from God. Christ have mercy on me. Oh, maybe, I don't know anything about the crew members beyond that McCulloch was a Catholic. And whatever, what kind of Catholic was she? That's for God alone, period, to say. I have no idea. I assume she was the greatest saint. I don't know. But imagine someone on the crew who's like maybe not been living the best life. Maybe that's the moment, God have mercy on me. They're in heaven now because of that free fall moment when they were still alive. Despite the horror you think, like, oh, it would have been better for, better for them to be killed instantly. We don't know if they were killed instantly. In fact, at least some of the crew were believed to be alive and at least briefly conscious after the breakup as the personal egress air packs were activated for Smith. This guy's trying to activate these air packs. And also two other unidentified crew members, but not for the captain, Scobie. The PAPs were not intended for in-flight use. The astronauts never trained with them for an in-flight emergency. Uh, while analyzing the wreckage, investigators discovered this, that several electrical system switches on Smith's right-hand panel had been moved from their usual launch positions. The switches had lever locks on top of them that must be pulled out before the switch could be moved. Later tests established that ne neither the force of the explosion nor the impact of the ocean could have moved them, indicating that Smith made the switch changes, presumably in a futile attempt to restore electrical power to the cockpit after the crew cabin detached from the rest of the orbiter. These people to add the horror to this, you know, are aware of what has just happened. Um, July 28, 1986. This is exactly half a year after the the you know um half a year after the disaster. NASA's associate administrator for space flight, Richard H. Truly, releases a report. And here are the findings of that report. Ready? They are inconclusive. The impact of the crew compartment with the ocean surface was so violent that evidence of damage occurring in the final seconds, which followed, followed the disintegration, were masked. Like we, we don't know what happened. They, they're lost in the haze. But our final conclusions are three. This report, half a year after the disaster, makes three final conclusions. The cause of death of the Challenger astronauts cannot be positively determined. Number two, the forces to which the crew were exposed during orbiter breakup were probably not sufficient to cause death or serious injury. And three, the crew possibly, but not certainly, lost consciousness in the seconds following orbiter breakup due, due to in-flight loss of crew module pressure. Uh, so indeed, pressurization could have enabled consciousness for the entire, far, entire, entire fall until impact, or if it was lost, it would have passed out. But the crew cabin hit the ocean surface at 207 miles per hour. Um, approximately two minutes and 45 seconds after breakup. And um, 
the estimated deceleration was 200 G, way, way more than anyone can, and it goes out saying, withstand in any possible way, way exceeding the structural limits of the crew, everything. Reagan was scheduled to give the 1986 State of the Union that night. After a discussion with his aides, he postpones it and instead addresses the nation about the disaster from the Oval Office. Those of you watching on YouTube, that was a 27 second clip from C-SPAN that I started this maple syrup history episode with. On January 31st, Ronald and Nancy Reagan, of course, Nancy Reagan is a super famous first lady, but if anyone's like Nancy, she is the first lady, Reagan's wife. Ronald and Nancy, President and First Lady, traveled to Johnson Space Center to speak at a memorial service honoring the crew members during the ceremony, an Air Force band saying, God bless America, as NASA T-38 Talon jets flew directly over the scene in the traditional missing man formation. Nationally televised coverage of the launch and explosion was provided by uh, CNN. And for a long time, until some amateur videos are found later, that's thought to be the only kind of like on-camera footage, but it was very good footage, sadly, because it was being broadcast, as Betsy said, to, to, to school children throughout the world. We have 13 minutes left. You know, one thirty is when this class officially ends. It's more than enough time to talk about the Catholic reactions. Um, I have for you um, five Catholic reactions. Number one, Time, Time Magazine. Not a Catholic magazine. Everyone understand that, right? Time Magazine, a secular magazine, duh, LOL. Their article about this, February 10th, 1986, quote, their title is, Space, They Slip the Surly Bonds of Earth to Touch the Face of God. Uh, even a secular magazine, here they're quoting, um, that's, that's what Reagan said, but it's like even a secular magazine, Times of Tragedies, they always talk about Catholicism and disasters, Black Plague, whatever, people, there's no atheist in a foxhole, cliche, people turn to God, people seek answers from God in the face of the unanswerable. How did this happen? The Catholic Telegraph, reaction number two, on January 28th, 2016, 30, 30 um, year anniversary. Throwback Tuesday, slip the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Um, they begin quoting Reagan on this. That's the how Time Magazine came up with, with their title, quoting him. The crew of the space shuttle Challenger honored us by the manner in which they lived their lives, Reagan said. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. A February 7th, 1986 edition of the Catholic Telegraph. You guys ready for this? Remember, this Catholic Telegraph article is on the 30th anniversary, January of 2016. They quote their own article from February 7th, 86, in the aftermath. The February 7th, 1986 edition of the Catholic Telegraph featured the now iconic image of the explosion in the following headline, quote, God didn't do it. The story written by the National Catholic News Service's Joe Michael Feist quotes a young child who attended a memorial mass and struggled to understand the disaster. From the story, quote, I just don't understand, he told a television reporter, his voice breaking with emotion, why God wanted to take them now. And that kid that speaks for all of us, you know, in the face of these tragedies, right? I have no idea why. Um, shout out to my sons, Soren and Bjorn, who are huge fans of maple syrup history. Huge. They're my biggest fans of maple syrup history. You guys don't even, they know more about maple syrup history than I do. Uh, we, they watched a couple documentaries on the Challenger. And that's one of the things my oldest son, who's 10 years old, asked. He's like, well, what if they prayed to Jesus? Why did this happen? Like, why did God allow this? And this all of us ask this question. This is the oldest question, the problem of evil. And we can answer nothing except, like, from that book of Job. The book of Job has 42 chapters. God answers Job at the end. Like, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Yeah, we're not God. I don't know why it happened. I don't know. A Catholic priest from the Diocese of Oakland answered, quote, I would just try to explain that God didn't do it. It just caught fire and blew up. That's a mystery because we know that God permits evil, but God is not a puppeteer who, you know, pulls strings and controls all events. We talk often this class in Augustine's about where sin abounds, grace all the more. Augustine, oh, happy fault, oh, Felix culpa, that merited for us so great a redeemer. The Joseph story, his brothers try to literally assassinate him, throw him in a sister, and he becomes Egypt grain minister, prime minister. Like, all we know is God permits evil. It's the mystery of evil. Um, mysterium uh, inquitatis. But, but out of that comes a greater good. The ultimate evil is what? Executing God is Good Friday. It's ultimate evil, murdering God. Out of that comes the greatest good of Easter Sunday. So, uh, reaction number three, John Paul II at the Vatican. 
which is actually rare. Remember, a lot of our disasters, like the popes don't comment. I, I struggle to find a comment from uh, popes or high-ranking bishops about the Hindenburg, Mount St. Helens. This is an international huge thing. John Paul II calls them, quote, courageous pioneers for the progress of science and humanity. Um, asks during a Vatican City audience for everyone there to pray for these American astronauts. And he says, quote, the tragedy provokes deep sorrow in my soul. Like he stops his papal audience and says, let's remember these people. They're very beautiful. Truly in that moment, you know, for all Christians, all people, as Christ's vicar representative on earth, how beautifully is he shepherding Krista McCulloch and her family, you know? In that moment. Reaction number four, I encourage you to read this. If you're like, wait, Catholic Telegraph article, January 28th. Catholic World Report, article number four, January 28th. Yeah, they're often, you know, memorial articles written on, on the date themselves. This article is not even a year old. This year, January 28th, 2023, Marcus Brodi. If you watch EWTN, you, know, you might know Marcus Brodi from you know, Journey Home. He's a former Protestant pastor. Um, he converted to Catholicism and had an EWTN show. Anyone watch Pints of Aquinas? Marcus Brody was Matt Frad before Matt Frad, like that kind of show, like having people come on and tell me your conversion story or whatever. Uh, Marcus Grody, Catholic World Report, January 28th, a warning ignored. 37 years ago, it happened. Seven astronauts suffered horrendous death, exploded. Almost anyone, at least in America, who's live at that moment has the visual image of that explosion etched into our memories. Where were you when it happened? He talks about it. he's going to begin his first solo. Uh, pastoring uh, post at a small country Presbyterian church. Grodi himself converted from uh, Protestantism to Catholicism. I was in my office preparing the notes for my first sermon in my new congregation. I paused to watch the television broadcast of the live launch, to watch the successful launch. Of course, it's going to be great. This is awesome. Christian McCulloch. And with horror, I saw the plume of the explosion. When I returned to my desk, still trembling, I set my sermon notes aside, for I knew I had to change my intended pleasant greetings to the discussion of far more serious matter. So uh, Marcus Grodi, Catholic World Report, a warning ignored. And he goes on to talk about how to not ignore the warnings in our life, like his engineers ignored the O-ring stuff. Mm. And he says there's a great Wall Street Journal article, quote, the man who tried to stop the space shuttle challenges launch. Um, finally, last article, last reaction. And I love how we're doing with time. We spent a lot of time on the disaster facts today, rightfully so. It is a super tragic, extremely interesting, somber, just very American event. And I hope, you know, once more, God rest the souls of those seven people. God bless their families. I hope we did it justice in this episode, talking about them. They're, they're heroes. They're heroism. You know, it's kind of like desire to go make the most of your talents. Kristen McAuliffe could have easily been like, no, I have a good life. No, I have, I have a dream to fulfill becoming an athlete. She, she achieved it. Kristen McAuliffe. In this tragedy, she and the other six astronauts, they're all success stories. Um, everyone knows in wars, often the kind of greatest glory is to lost causes. Krista McAuliffe went there and did it. She died gloriously. You know, it's, it's horrendously, awfully, disgustingly sad what happened. Can't imagine the sorrow for children and and family. If she was in a state of grace, God willing, she died a glorious death, you know, blowing up in a spaceship, trying to get to the stars. I mean, it's, it's, it's very beautiful in a certain sense. You want to cry tears of sorrow, but it's also very beautiful in a sense. So I hope we've done justice to, to these people uh, and the heroes that they were. Last article is from Texas Catholic Herald, July 9th, 2019. Quote, or here's the title of the article if you want to find it. Texas Catholic Herald, article titled, As It Is in Heaven, Understanding the Grim Realities of Spaceflight. That's a good article that compares. Does anyone know the... Um, Space Shuttle Columbia disaster in 2003. On February 1st, 2003, the Space sh uh, Shuttle Columbia exploded. And of course, everyone was, was killed. And people talk about when this more recent, the Challenger obviously is more famous, but it's just as devastating for the family. Similar event, Space Shuttle explosion, everyone dead on board. People talk about, well, let me just quote from Carmelite Father J.J. McCarthy. Um, the pastor at St. Bernadette Church, he tells the Texas Catholic Herald in 2003, quote, uh, it was deja vu for the ones who were here since the Challenger accident. There's a lot of heartache and a lot of grief, but also a great faith. The members of the NASA family who are at St. Bernadette see their life as a contribution to humanity. They see it as a contribution to exploration of space for the well-being of humans. That's very, very beautiful. Um, these people are not 
you know, Matthew 25, oh, you were demanding master. I buried my talent. Oh, well, you know, I, I had the I had the ability to handle G-forces in the mathematical brain to become an astronaut. I was just scared. No, it's your heroes. People are going to do this kind of stuff, not just to take, you know, very cool photos on uh, spaceships and have bragging rights to a party. And certainly you do. So what did you last week? Well, you know, I, made, I became Fortune 500. Awesome, man. What about you? Uh, I'm training for the Olympics. How about you? I was in space. <laughs> Like it is the top story. It, it's an awesome story, but they're, they are doing it, you know, out of the best motives, hopefully. Um, really quickly, closing up. Um, while NASA's, from the article, Texas Catholic Herald, while NASA's shuttle program was grounded for 32 months after the explosion, NASA's efforts continued. And though Kristen McCullough, who was an active member of St. Peter's Parish in Concord, New Hampshire, was the only Catholic aboard the Challenger flight, the explosion drew the attention of St. John Paul II on the feast of the presentation of Jesus in the temple. The Pope shared his closeness with the Columbia victims. So as the Pope commented on Challenger, comments in the Columbia on February 2nd, 2003, quote, I invite all of you to pray for the victims of the accident who died while accomplishing an international scientific mission. At this time of severe trial, I am spiritually close to the relatives to whom I offer the assurance of my prayer. And very beautifully, I don't know how you feel about George W. Bush, He's a great president, terrible president, endless wars. No, it was good we got in those wars. Oh, man, his quotes are so dumb. He's actually great. Anyone know that W. Bush actually is a very accomplished painter? I don't know if anyone knows that. George W. Look up George W. Bush's painting. He's actually a good painter. Yeah, I'm not even kidding. Yeah. So what, what do you think about George, George W. Bush? This is actually very beautiful. In 2004, this is how I'm going to close this article. Actually, I'm going to let Betsy do her quote first, then I'll talk, talk about Bush. Betsy writes, Having civilians in the space shuttle seems similar to having civilians visiting the Titanic. Yeah, I maybe I don't know, right? There's maybe like, maybe you can say in this moment, kind of like leave it to the professionals. But I will say in response to that, although I, I think you have a lot of merit in saying that, again, Krista McAuliffe was a legit astronaut. After all she went through, think about the selection process. They weren't just selecting her out of 11,000 because she had a great smile and she was nice. There was serious psychological, physical, withstand G-forces type testing. I think I'd fail immediately. I was on some ride once that was like no G-force and I almost passed out. I mean, she has to like, you know, Krista McAuliffe had to handle all the kind of, she was, she was fit for the job. So I would say Krista McAuliffe is not a civilian by the time the Challenger is ready to take off. There's seven missions, the seventh of which finally takes off to tragedy. But closing with George W. Bush, in 2004, President George W. Bush conferred posthumous um, Congressional Space Medals of Honor to all 14 crew members killed in the Challenger and Columbia accidents. Very beautiful, fitting kind of um, uh, mm -hmm. honor. And one of those things that is certainly, I would say, not, not an empty gesture, but something very beautiful.